History Miami resident historian uh, here to uh, bring you another uh, Miami history story today, Friday, and uh, excited to be with you. This is the uh, the final of a series of six talks that we've delivered over the last two weeks on different elements of uh, Greater Miami's history, especially uh, different neighborhoods. We looked at Coral Gables, we looked at Overtown, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, Miami Springs, which is a very unique neighborhood. Sometimes it's under the proverbial radar screen, but nevertheless, it's significant for its distinctiveness, but also, I believe, for its founder, who is a person who I don't think has ever really gained the notoriety and credit he deserves for what he's done as an aviator, an inventor, um, and as it turns out, a city planner and builder, and that's Glenn Curtis. And so I'd like to talk today then about Miami Springs. And first of all, uh, kind of give you the lay of the land, uh, what it is, what it comprises. It's only 393 acres, and it's in a triangular form or shape. Um, we all have an idea where it is. It's uh, just north of the airport. Uh, it's an area that's bounded on the, uh, the west by Ludlam Road. On the east, um, a portion of Okeechobee Road, which runs in the direction of and parallel to in some places. Uh, the Miami Canal. Southern portion includes parts of 36th Street um, as you're moving in a westerly direction. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a beautiful garden spot. Uh, it's a place that um, has a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of long time residents. It doesn't have the mobility. People moving in and out like a lot of other neighborhoods. I think once people find it, uh, they really found a place that they want to invest a lot in and stay for a good portion of time. The population of Miami Springs today is somewhere in the 14,000 person rank. It really doesn't have much opportunity to expand since its borders are pretty rigid and uh, in some ways are blocked by major street arteries and in one case by the uh, Miami Canal. Uh, but again, uh, what makes it so fascinating to me, and I've studied it for a long time, is its founder, Glenn Curtis. Glenn Curtis Born in Hammondsport, uh, New York, a small town in New York, 1878. Uh, early on, he was a very precocious sort, uh, got involved in the bicycle craze that swept America in the latter part of the 19th century, and uh, then moved quickly by the beginning of the 20th century into motorcycles as well as automobiles. And he set world speed racing records, especially with motorcycles. In fact, in 1907, he was billed as, and I quote, the world's fastest man, end quote. Later on, he became involved in airplanes. In fact, he was a rival, if you will, of the Wright brothers, and there was some bad blood between them that extended well into the 19-teens, um, into the early 1920s at least. Uh, he developed uh, aircraft engines, he designed airplanes, he built airplanes, he set flight records uh, as early as 1910. He won many awards for that. But I think some of the most interesting awards he won uh, included the following in 1911 for his achievements uh, in aviation as well as in public demonstrations of what he was doing with airplanes he was awarded aviator license number one in the United States and he'd also come to hold pilot license number one in France uh, he was also billed by this time because so much of aviation of course centered on seaplanes he was billed as a father of naval aviation uh, for his design of a successful hydroplane that landed and took off on water, which really is a precursor of what's gonna happen with the great Sikorsky and other manufacturing seaplanes that Pan American employed at a dinner key uh, over a long period of time. Um, in 1919, and the war's over at this point, World War I, by a year, Curtis's NC-4 flying boat, as it was billed, became the first airplane to cross the Atlantic Ocean. And you might say, well, wait a minute, wasn't that 1927 with Charles A. Lindbergh? Lindbergh was the first person to cross the Atlantic without stopping somewhere. Previous pilots stopped in places like the Azores Islands, far off the coast of Portugal, before they commenced their flight to the European mainland. And uh, this was part of that particular scene. Even more famous, I think, and you can hear the birds in the background, I've shifted back to my office from where I was the last couple of uh, talks. Even more famous was this Curtis J.N. Jenny, which was used to train just a year and two earlier, about 95% of the United States Army Air Force pilots in World War I. Um, Curtis by then had already moved to Miami. In fact, he was persuaded as far back as 1912, which is a year after uh, planes were 
probably first seen by Miamians in 1911, and we mentioned this uh, in a previous discussion on Alapata. Uh, he was persuaded by Everett Sewell, who was like this great Chamber of Commerce character from Miami, a three-term mayor later on, uh, just a tremendous pitch man for the city. Uh, he encouraged on the heels of that successful uh, birthday celebration in 1911 for Curtis to move to the Miami area and open up a flight training school. And as I mentioned in our talk on Wednesday, that school opened somewhere close to today's Northwest 17th Avenue and 20th Street uh, in Hialeah, excuse me, in, in Alapata. And it was up and going by the mid-1910s. Uh, he also had hydroplane instruction that he was conducting in Biscayne Bay, just off the shoreline of where the Royal Palm Hotel stood in the southern sectors of downtown Miami, today's DuPont Plaza neighborhood. But in World War I, and we found ourselves involved in that by April of 1917, Curtis became a, um, a training pilot for fledgling pilots, some of whom were British aerialists, as they were called in those days. And he set up a training school initially in Hialeah, which was like Miami Springs, uh, drained Everglades swampland, as well as at a place uh, near Lake Palmer. Lake, lake Palmer is a lake off the south bank of the Miami Canal. It would be today in the vicinity of the big intermodal uh, complex that would be just east of Miami International Airport. And that's where he trained pilots then all the way through the end of World War I. Also by this time, he found himself in a partnership with a man named James Bright, who came from Missouri. Um, he was introduced to Bright by a dairyman from Missouri, uh, and Bright, as it turned out, was the owner of thousands of acres of dairy land in today's Hialeah, and eventually would overlap in today's Opelika, Miami, Miami Springs, uh, and other places. The two men got along well, and uh, toward the latter part of the 1910s and early 1920s, they formed a couple of companies. One was the Curtis Bright Ranch Company, and the other was the Florida Ranch and Dairy Corporation. And they invested, um, uh, James Bright did, uh, Glenn Curtis did, a million dollars a piece in these companies. And what they spent the money on through these companies was investing in additional Everglades reclaimed land. So their land holdings extended beyond 14,000 acres by the beginning of the 1920s. And both of these gentlemen, along with their companies, were instrumental in development, as I've mentioned already, of Hylia, uh, Miami Springs, Opelika, uh, you might wonder about that term Opelok, and it's always a wonderful anecdote about it. it we believe it is said uh, emanates from a seminal term. The term, if you kind of broke it down for pronunciation's sake, uh, sounds like this, Opatisha Waka Laka, which means a, a wooded hammock. A, a hammock is a sort of an island in the swamp where people can live. They can't live down in the water itself, uh, and there are trees both in the hammock and just around the particular hammock area. And so you've got this island surrounded by swampland, Opelika. Um, Curtis uh, and Bright would develop Hialeah, and they had great success with that. Hialeah really is the first area, first community developed out of Everglades swampland in that vicinity. It becomes a going community by the mid-1920s, but land's already up for sale as early as 1921 in that area. and. Um, I think Curtis had sort of a bittersweet feeling about Hylia. It developed quickly. They sold a lot of lots. They had some fine Mediterranean buildings, but he thought it was developing in a helter-skelter way. It wasn't carefully developed. And so he really wanted a, uh, a community that he could really um, control in a more fashionable way. Thus, he bought a large tract of land then on the south bank of the Miami Canal. That canal was built, incidentally, between 1909 and 1913 one of about five or so drainage canals emanating from the East Coast. One came from the West Coast that drained the Everglades. They all ended up at Lake Okeechobee. And so he's building now with this acquisition on the south bank of the Miami Canal, a new community that he calls Country Club Estates. And in some ways he was influenced because he got going on this development 1923, 24, 25, 26, he was influenced by the very methodical approach that George Merrick uh, took to developing. I think it was also influenced by the City Beautiful Movement that era, that grew, which grew out of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, and that is uh, you want green spaces, you want waterways, you want parks, uh, you want carefully developed neighborhoods, you want fine architecture, and all of this would go into the initial building of Country Club Estates, that's the first name 
of Miami Springs. He also chose a very distinctive style of architecture, the Pueblo style of architecture. He was familiar with this, this style, which uh, had appeared already in the southwest United States, uh, namely in Arizona and New Mexico, because he had traveled so much as a young aviator, a motorcyclist, and what have you. And he came back with the idea of developing then a community based on that style. The style would include such elements, in other words, if we looked at a building that we would call Pueblo, some people call it Pueblo Revival, I like to call it Pueblo. It would, it's a style really that was influenced by Native American elements, Spanish colonial elements, Spanish mission elements. Um, it especially was based on, I think, the adobe homes of the Southwestern American Indians. The elements would be buttresses, hand-molded shapes, textured stucco in place of what had been the original Pueblo sun-dried mud surfaces, irregular parapets above the roof level, irregular openings, a flat roof, exposed beam ends called vigas, and sometimes an enclosed patio courtyard. Curtis wanted a city, as I mentioned before, that would be also a garden spot. Um, and so, again, he set out methodically to develop it. Lot prices were pretty steep, at least for 1923-24, when the first lots went on sale. They were fetching as much as $1,000 and $1,200 per lot. They sold slowly, uh, partly in consequence of the price. And many were owned uh, and bought by some of the principals of the Curtis Bright Company. Uh, all of them in concert with, in terms of how they developed, in terms of the restrictions on them, according to this very careful plan that uh, we believe was influenced by George Merrick's approach to Coral Gables. Uh, something else we should note that the town had a very distinctive center called initially the Civic Center with an engineering building there, a Curtis Bright administration building, a bank building. And within the center of this area, uh, there was a circle. And that circle had a Pueblo style, uh, kind of like a gazebo, a bandstand. And at the peak of the boom in 1925, uh, Curtis was able to hire Arthur Pryor, who had really gained renown in Royal Palm Park, again, down in today's DuPont Plaza neighborhood, for the concerts he put on on a daily basis uh, for uh, both residents of Miami, but also a lot of the visitors that were kind of pouring into town speculating in real estate. And so that becomes really, I think, a drawing point for his neighborhood, too. The most gracious, beautiful homes included those of the Curtis family members. Built a beautiful home for his mother, for example, as well as other uh, administrative heads in his enterprises. The smaller single-family homes backed them up, literally behind them. The grandest of the homes in this fledgling community was not surprisingly that of Glenn Curtis. Um, his home stood on a 9.3-acre site. It was a Pueblo-style mansion that he called Dar Era Aja or House of Happiness, and it came complete with a lake. Um, it's also important to note that uh, it may have been influenced by a building uh, known as the Balboa Building in Balboa Park in San Diego, which was a carryover, a result of a 1915 exposition, the Panama, California Exposition. And um, Curtis's home, in many ways, is a ringer for that building. Uh, so you've, you've got a Curtis, he's developing Miami Springs, he's developing it slowly, methodically, uh, but yet the boom also has a great influence on how land is selling, the prices are going up just a bit on that. The boom did collapse, as you mentioned before, in some of our lectures in 1926, uh, as other buildings were being now a move toward completion at Miami Springs. Probably the most interesting of the buildings, other than the Curtis Mansion as we know it today, to be completed at this time, and in fact it was completed quite late in 1927, was this very large hotel that he built called uh, the Hotel Country Club. And it was a Pueblo Indian themed building. It's still standing as the Fairhaven Rest Home today. Very large uh, building. It failed financially. That boom collapsed in 26. The mighty hurricane struck in September. The area was in an economic depression by the latter part of 1926. And so Curtis would sell off that hotel, uh, and he was able to lure a, a man by the name of Dr. John Kellogg of serial fame, of physical fitness fame from Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, to the area. And um, he was uh, offering that hotel to Dr. Kellogg for $1, and Kellogg said, that's an outrageous price. I'll give you $10 for it. And so as the story goes, 
that large building sold for $10. And he would convert it then into what they called a sanitarium. This was a, a very popular way for people to restore their health. Would go to these places, be taken care of. They wanted a place that in many ways had a lot of fresh air, close to a waterway. We had a lot of places on the Miami River in the vicinity of today's Marlin Ballpark that were similar places in the 1930s and even the 1940s. Um, we mentioned today, of course, it's a retirement and rest center, Fair Haven. Glenn Curtis died at a relatively young age. He was 52 when he underwent an appendectomy. And as a result of that, uh, he passed away. It was kind of a botched operation. In the same year, his community's name changed from, as I mentioned before, Country Club Estates to Miami Springs for good reason. There are a plethora of freshwater springs underneath the surface of the area that comprises much of Miami Springs. In fact, the city of Miami's major water source has long been these springs coming out of today's Miami Springs. Miami Springs grew slowly in the Great Depression, the 1930s, slowly in World War II, but then it experienced ex explosive growth in terms of both population development and uh, the development of very many new homes there. And the homes, of course, were developed in a style other than the original Pueblo style, much as Carl Gables developed um, after World War II in a way completely different from the way George Merrick had envisioned it and had built those early buildings in what we today would call a Florida ranch style building. Um, one of the things, of course, that helped us so much was it had become increasingly a bedroom community for this very expansive airport complex immediately south of it uh, to be called Miami International Airport by 1948, the home of, for many years, both Eastern and National and Pan American Airways. Uh, so uh, a large percentage of the residents of Miami Springs after World War II were people who were directly connected uh, to the airlines just south of there. Historic preservation uh, was something that the people of Miami Springs embraced early on. Uh, they created an historic preservation board in the early 1980s. They began to designate a lot of properties, almost all of which were built in the Pueblo style. I had the good fortune uh, when I was teaching a class of Miami South Florida History at Miami Dade College many years ago to uh, bring my students over to Miami Springs um, and we visited uh, many historic structures including Fairhaven and the Curtis Mansion which at that point was just nearing completion in terms of its restoration but also the bridges that were declared historic two of them that connect uh, that cross the Miami Canal and connect uh, Miami Springs on the south with Hylia on the north and uh, I think if you sort of walk that area and look at those buildings head on, you really get a tremendous appreciation for their distinctiveness. And incidentally, that tour ended up uh, at the Curtis Mansion where uh, with History Miami, I delivered a, a, a talk on aviation in the area. And the talk was given on a beautiful October night in uh, the open courtyard in the rear. And the place was just filled with people, many of whom were retired employees. A couple of them, flight attendants wore their uniforms and there was at least one pilot who was adorned in his Pan Am uniform too. So it was, uh, it was quite a night and uh, this has been quite a community. And I'm glad we had an opportunity to, to discuss it. But what I'd like to do now, it's almost 20 after three, is go to any questions anybody might have. Um, Norma Orvitz uh, mentioned deed restrictions. Uh, Norma, I'm not sure if there are deed restrictions as to religion, race, et cetera, although I know that the golf course that was the centerpiece of this community uh, from 1922-23 on uh, was restricted to whites and it was the scene of a major federal court ruling in the early 50s desegregating it, becoming the first desegregated golf course that we know of in the state of Florida. But the restrictions I meant were the sorts of building materials you could use in those early homes, the style of the homes themselves uh, were the restrictions I was looking at. Was King Arthur's Court a preserved building? No, and that was a real attraction in the early decades following World War II in terms of a gathering place, an eating place, a partying place, what have you. Hi, Steve. Robert, Rob, hey, Rob. Um, thank you. Uh, Daniel Patrick O'Connell, Carl Fisher got his start in bikes and cars as well. Were he and Glenn Curtis acquainted before Florida? It's a great question I can't answer. They certainly were acquainted in Florida and they both of them had a love for speed. Uh, Fisher, though, was not a designer uh, of automobiles or motorcycles or bikes, but as you said, they had that parallel. They, 
the progression for transportation at that time were bicycles, motorcycles, cars, airplanes. And Fisher, certainly for the first three, was very much part of that scene, as, of course, was Glenn Curtis, and you could add that fourth for Curtis. Um, they became certainly acquainted in the Miami area. What Fisher did when he uh, not only arrived in Miami, but became a Miami, Miami Beach resident, was he reached out to anybody with money uh, for, among other reasons, investment opportunities and what he was doing. And um, let's see. Hi, Bert. Um, some of the uh, schools are mentioned in Miami Springs, wonderful schools. The Shepherd family says hello. Hi, Lainey. Casey, how you doing? Let's see. Let's see if we have any more questions uh, about this very unique place. And I wanted to mention to you something else. You might even hear a southern accent there today or somebody even pronounced in Miami, Miami. Uh, again, some of the residents have been there for many, many decades. Um, Karen, can you visit the mansion? The mansion has become the venue for so many events, everything from weddings to different talks uh, to contests. It's open to the public on a regular basis. And it's really a lovely place. They've done a major restoration. They raised many millions of dollars to restore it over a lengthy period of time. A lady named Joellen Edwards um, was really instrumental in that. Rob says, you know anything about a Curtis and Rogers airport on Watson Island? What kind of operation was it for how long? There was a, um, a Curtis Wright uh, aviation base uh, on the bayfront across from Watson Island in the 1930s. And it was a seaplane operation that operated relatively briefly. Okay, let's see. I think that is about everything. I wanted to mention one thing. Oh, hi, ZD. I wanted to mention that uh, we are offering a History of Miami a, um, a series of classes beginning in late June uh, through July. I think there's four classes and then an introductory class in June on the history of Greater Miami. I'll be teaching them. Uh, we'll be doing it through Zoom. We'd love to have you in there. I know we're sending a link with this particular uh, presentation today where you could hit that link and find out more about the class. And if you wanted to register, uh, we'd love to have you do that. Uh, but, uh, but please consider, we'd love to have you in there. And it just covers the whole gamut going back to the native Miami who lived here many thousands of years ago. I can see right now it's just popped up. But I want to thank everybody so much for joining me over these uh, six lectures. And we had 10 last month. So um, even though we've been sequestered, I've been able to, uh, to share uh, a, a lot of material with you and also get some tremendous feedback and questions and comments uh, from the folks who have tuned into this. And I'm just really appreciative of that. And I look forward to seeing you again and sharing more Miami history with you or greater Miami history with you. Uh, have a great day. And... Uh, Hopefully we'll see you soon, okay? Thanks again. Uh, please join us for our, our next offerings, which would be the classes, as well as probably some other uh, talks too. Thank you.